All right, everybody, off we go. Thanks so much for coming out with us. Now, if you're not familiar with the area, this is the Cape Fear River that we're on. And this river is the longest river in North Carolina. About 202 miles long, runs north to back of us, to south. And the river originates way up north in an area of North Carolina known as the Piedmont. It's two rivers that converge together. The Deep River and the Hob River join up. So that's what creates this river. So the river then flows south down here to Wilmington, continues to flow south under the bridge, so it eventually reaches the ocean, and the ocean's about 25 miles from this point. Now, the Cape Fear River is what's known as being brackish water. So it's a combination of salt water and fresh water. So we do have a lot of different types of animals that live here. We do have alligators here. We do have dolphins. Every once in a while, a lost manatee picks up from the water, and we actually see one about two years ago. Sea turtles are in here and a lot of different species of fish. Big fish in this river, we have catfish that are over 100 pounds in this river. The depth varies between 10 and approximately 60 feet. Now this river is also a true tidal river. Two tide changes daily. Now the bridge in front of us, this is the Cape Fear Memorial Bridge put here in 1969. And it's a different type of bridge. It's what's known as a vertical lift bridge which means the center span raises straight up in the air and it's actually raised and lowered by two big weights on each of those main support columns. So if you look inside those support columns, you'll actually see the big weights. So that's what actually raises and lowers this river. I'm sorry, the, uh, the bridge. So the center span goes up and down. The bridge was put here in 1969. Now over to the left, you do have a uh, boat on a trailer. You have a great launch ramp right over there. Public launch ramp, so you can launch and come here both for free. And it has a great parking lot too. Boats. They range in size between 85 up to 105 foot long with a lot of horsepower. This big one to the right of us is pushing about 4,000 horsepower. Now these big tugs serve a vital role in the river. They are responsible for getting our big ships properly secured to one of the berths at the state port. So the big ships work their way north on the river. They're met by the tugs. These tugs hook up to those big ships and they push them against one of the birds at the state port. Now again, when those ships are ready to leave, the tugs hook up to those ships, they pull them away from the dock, they spin the ships around so they can head back out to sea. Now it usually takes one or two of those tugs on each of these ships, but uh, sometimes they call in a third tug, especially on one of the bigger container ships. And those bigger ships are only 1,200 foot long. So when the wind's not co cooperating, they'll actually call in a third tug to give a hand. see uh, storage tanks up and down the river, especially here on the left side. They hold different petrochemicals that are brought in here on chemical tankers. So the chemical tankers will come in, they'll tie up to the bird here. The different hoses that go into the tanks. So depending upon what they're bringing in, they'll hook up to the correct hose to pump out into the holding tanks. Now a lot of these petrochemicals are used in plant manufacturing. So from here, the semi-tanker trucks will pick up those petrochemicals and take them to the plants for the manufacturing process. Now the right side of our boat, this is Eagles Island over there, which is two miles wide, seven miles long, was named after Dr. Richard Eagle back in the late 1700s. 
Now, Dr. Eagle was a land baron who was issued the first land grant for that island, and he was also the first person who was rice growing in this area. So he was the first producer of rice in this area. So Eagle's Island was all rice plantation. Now, the time they were growing rice in this region, Eagle's Island was a lot different than what it is now, and this river was a lot different than what it is now. Originally, Eagle's Island was a very flat island, and this river was very shallow, it was all fresh water. So let's start with Eagle's Island. The reason that there's an elevation over there about 65 feet is due to dredging that occurs in this river. And what dredging is, is basically digging out the river bottom to make it deeper. Now they've been dredging this river out since the early 1800s to make it deeper originally for the big supply barges to come up the river. Now they do dredge this river out every fall and winter to keep it at a certain depth for these big ships to come in. So they take out millions of cubic yards of dredge material that they have to put it somewhere. So on Eagles Island, is where they place all the dredge material that's taken out of this river. And they've been doing that for many, many years. So that's how they build the elevation up. Now the river has changed. So they started dredging this river out as early as the early 1800s to make it deeper for those barges. That's when the river started to change. So being a tidal river with two tide changes a day, once they increase the depth of this river, the salt water came into the river. Now the salt water actually stayed here because they increased the depth of the river. So that's what changed it to brackish water. So that put an elimination to the rice production because it took away the fresh water they used for irrigation. So they could no longer grow rice on Eagle Island. But something else occurred in this region when the salt water came into the river. Anybody notice a lot of dead trees we have here? Yep. Right? Thousands of dead trees. We have a few to the right, not many, but further north on the river where you see the majority of them, those are called cypress trees, that they were affected by the soil water. So the soil water came in here, these bold cypress trees absorbed the salt and started burning the trees from the inside. And then over a period of time, wound up killing those trees. So that's the reason why we have so many of these dead trees. So nobody lives on Eagles Island. It is controlled by the Army Corps of Engineers. Today. Uh, the other day we had about five of them. Tomorrow, 
well, we could have zero here. It all depends. They're all on schedules and they come in at different time intervals. So the port is broken into two sections. We have what's known as the bolt break side of the port, which we're in right now, the north side, and all the bolt material comes and goes from here. And then further south, where the big blue cranes are, that's the container side of the port, where the container ships come in. And I see we have a container ship that came in here just a little while ago. A lot of imports and exports coming from here. We do export a lot of different types of wood products from here including wood chips, wood pellets, uh, furniture. We also get truck and car parts here. Different metals come in here, aluminum, steel. We're importing different types of quarry products, including sand, rock, gravel. We're exporting different types of poultry, including chickens, turkeys from here. Pork products, a lot of pork products are also exported from here, as well as fruits and vegetables. Petroleum products come in here, the tanks you can see to the left. So there's a lot of different types of materials in and out of this port. And this port is actually growing in size over the last couple of years. estimate of ships. When we get up to this container ship in front of us, the length of that ship is 726 foot long. So when I mention the bigger ships that are over 1,200 foot that come in here, you get a real scope as to the size of these ships. So those big container ships that hold 14,000 shipping containers, a ship of this size probably has between seven to 9,000 shipping containers. So they're actively loading and unloading that container ship right now. And these big container ships are actually here the shortest amount of time. So they don't unload all the containers at one port. It's basically like a UPS truck on land. They'll go from port to port, unload some containers, take on some containers, and they'll keep going around to their group is complete. So the crane operators will work no matter what time these ships come in here. It could be 1 in the morning, it could be 11 o'clock at night. They'll all have a crew ready to load them on those ships. So their stay at the port varies between 12, 18 to 20 hours. And then they're gone. Now the crane operators that are loading and unloading this ship in front of us, highly skilled individuals, a fully trained crane operator, is capable of loading and unloading between 40 and 50 shipping containers per hour. Now the crane operators are actually in a glass booth on the underside of the crane. So if you get a little closer to that, look on the underside of the crane, you'll see that carriage going back and forth from the ship. That's where the crane operator sits. There goes one going back. The glass booth, they have to be able to see right under their legs so they can pick up those containers. It's about 163 feet up in the air. So if you have a fear of heights, it's not going to be a job for you. We've actually had crane operators on here and they love their job. And they work in four hour shifts. And the reason for that is they figured four hours is about how long a person can go without needing a bathroom break. Because there's no bathrooms up there. So they all work in four hour shifts. I've got 
got a little trivia for you folks. Anybody watch movies? Nobody? Maybe? No? Oh, you think? Okay. Anybody see the movie Iron Man 3? Yep. All right, now I got it. <laughs> Remember the end of the movie, the big fight scene that they had? They were jumping on cranes. Well, these were the cranes. They actually filmed that part of the movie here. So that part of the movie of Iron Man 3 was filmed over here. They actually filmed at night, and they closed the port down, and they filmed uh, several nights completing that. of the port. This port was not always here. What was here originally was a shipbuilding company. It was called the North Carolina Shipbuilding Company. And they built ships for World War II between the period 1941 to 1946. They created 243 ships for World War II and they were all produced right from this area. You get a good look at the crane operator's booth. Look on the other side of this first crane, you'll see that glass and white booth. And that's where the operator sits. And there's another one going back towards the dock. And so as I mentioned, 726 foot long, so add another uh, maybe five, 600 feet onto this ship. Gives you a good size. folks that's a little bit about the port so we're going to make our turn here work back towards the bridge and we get a little further north i got a few more fun facts to play in on
actually hit that shoal and broke up. Treacherous condition. So the ones that made a safe passage at this point were so happy they actually celebrated. And the way that they celebrated back then is every crew member aboard that ship was issued a dram of rum. Rum was a drink at the time, and a dram is a measured amount, so a little less than a shot glass. So every crew member had a dram of rum signifying a safe passage up the river. Now, why did they celebrate here? Well, back then, we thought in the 1500s, this river was a lot different. It was a lot narrower, both sides of the river, all tree lines, so it all looked the same. Except over here, to the right, Grand Tree Point. There was an old cypress tree that grew out into the river, it was very big. So they knew that that was an area, each time a boat would come up here, they were safe and they would celebrate. So they celebrated where that tree was. But that tree, you don't see over there anymore because uh, sometime in the 1940s when they were dredging this part of the river out, a worker, they said by mistake, cut that tree down. So it's no longer over there. And that's Grand Tree Point. Now, Grand Tree Point, this also goes uh, kind of hand in hand with how they named the river. It refers to that shoal that extends 30 miles out into the river. The first explorer, when he found that shoal and he found the mouth of the river, he put on his handwritten map that he just found the Cape of Fear River. Cape, referring to the shape of that shoal, kind of in a uh, half moon shape protecting the mouth of the river, and fear because they were fearful of the shoal. So he put the two together and he said that he found the Cape of Fear River. And then in the early 1700s, another explorer came up here and uh, he put on his handwritten map, kind of just shortened that one up, and he said that he found the Cape Fear River. So that's basically how they named the Cape Fear the Cape Fear River. a quick story about the bridge in front of us, the Cape Fear Memorial Bridge. So it was put up in 69 and different type of bridge, the vertical lift. So 
where that center stand goes straight up in the air. So they trained all the bridge tenders on how to properly operate that bridge. So all the bridge tenders were opening and closing the bridge. They all went through rotation. Not a problem. Then 1977. 1977, an incident happened on the bridge where the bridge started to go off by the bridge tender and there was still a row of cars in the center span. So the bridge started to go up and of course there's one car at the end. So it was on the right side. It couldn't go anywhere, the bridge is going up. If you backed up, go over the bridge. If you went forward, there's cars in front of them. So it just so happened that part of his car was on the overhang of the bridge. So he jumped out just in time before his car was lifted up and fell into the water. So the car was still in there and it's a Cadillac. It's actually in the, towards the right side of the bridge at the bottom of the river. So luckily he didn't get hurt. He knew enough to jump out of the car. So uh, there was a Cadillac at the bottom of the river if you're looking for a slice of these car. <laughs> so used. Yeah, absolutely.
fishing at Four Point. Both sides of the river used to have shipbuilding companies. On the left side, on Eagles Island, used to be the Beery Ship Manufacturing Company over there. And then on the right side, coming up you're going to see this big white house with the big backyard. That's called the Cassidy House. That was another shipbuilding company. Both of the companies merged together and they actually created ironclad ships here for the Civil War. So they were produced right down here. There it is, that's the Cassidy House. Now being such a big shipping area in the early 1900s, they actually abandoned some real old vessels here on the left side on Eagles Island. Right up in front of us, you'll see some uh, roasted out big round metal cylinders sticking up out of the water. So those are steam boilers from some old steamships. So between the bridge and the battleship, state divers documented 37 abandoned ships that were left over there. Now some of those ships, they date back to the mid-1800s. Now right in back of these duplex homes to the right, you'll see that big mansion sticking up with about five or six chimneys. It's the Dudley Mansions where the first elected governor of North Carolina used to live, Governor Dudley. And a little further north, you'll see more mansions up on the hill. That elevation over there, that's called Society's Hill. That's where plantation owners used to live. There's also a couple real nice restaurants right on the river walk to the right of us. If anybody's looking for any, we've got the pilot house and Elijah sitting over there. And All right, everybody, so right up in front of us, that's our dock. On behalf of the crew, thanks so much for coming out with us. Hopefully you enjoyed yourself, learn a little bit about the area and the river. And maybe we'll see you right back out here on some future cruises. So enjoy the weekend, be safe out there, and we'll let you know in safety and off the boat.